Good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. This is my first time here at PWI, so it's a honor and a pleasure to join this important association and have a possibility of showing you what we've been doing in this year to extend Milan Metro Network. Uh, before I start, just uh, we were supposed to. There were supposed to be two of us. Uh, I'm. Um, I work as a transportation planner, so I take care of most. Um, general and strategic level of rate planning. I take care of feasibility studies and mobility consultancies while my colleague, uh, and I'm an architect by the way, my colleague engineer uh, Sergio Viganò couldn't come for personal reason, but if he was here, he would have explained you something more uh, technically related to railways in themselves. Um, so first of all, who we are, uh, name is MM nowadays, MM stands for Metropolitana Milanese, because the company was founded more than 60 years ago in order to plan and construct Milan Metro Network. Of course, all over the years we've been extending our range of, you know, um, works and engagements. Nowadays we take care of the planning of transportations in general, even if metros are still the core business and we've been acquired other services. Uh, this is what we do. Uh, it's important to notice that we are an engineering company. Uh, we are owned 100% uh, by the city of Milan, the municipality, so we are what we call a public company, but uh, we are completely independent for what concerns the administration point of view, We're just like an INC. Um, we are an engineering company and we take care of, the, of infrastructure from the concept to the construction management which means that we're able to provide all kinds of services regarding rails and um, mass transit infrastructure from the very initial concept to the construction management and the building site supervision. What we don't do, uh, we're not operators and we're not constructors. So uh, we also work when it's, you know, we advise the municipality in the process, you know, of tendering uh, works that, that are supposed to be built. And uh, on the right column, you see, you see what, we, what we do. So basically, metros are still the core business, but we also take care of railways, uh, LRT system, uh, uh, bus and metro bus lines, people movers, airports and roads and parkings as well, even if they are not the core business of the company, and also public buildings and exhibitions, like probably, I really hope that at least some of you have been to Expo 2015, the last a world exposition that took place in Milan has been a really great success. And um, apart from the infrastructure accessibility, which was of course our job, we also designed the entire uh, exposition site. Uh, where we are, oh, first of all, we are large speaking about you know, an Italian scale. As you probably know, Italy is really central on small, medium enterprises. So on an Italian scale, we are big. We're not that big on a global scale, but we're trying, you know, even according to our limited scale, to internationalize ourselves. That's what we've been doing in the last year. And let's see, kind of successful compared to, you know, the small size we have compared to giant multinational groups. Uh, we are based, of course, in Milan, Italy, and Italy is, is somehow, once again, the core business of our activities, but now we're doing several works abroad, uh, probably the largest uh, uh, under construction so far is the Metro Lima in Peru, and we have just opened an, a branch in Dubai, who's supposed to, we chose Dubai because it has somehow a hub location in Middle East and North Africa, which are our, you know, new frontiers of, you know, uh, exporting our know-how. And then, of course, we have a more than a half a century long bond with the city of Milan. Milan is the Italy's economic capital. It's its largest metro area. It's its large metro area, actually. We can tell you that uh, even if the municipality is kind of concentrated uh, from the urban point of view, like Paris City is, for example, in terms of metro area, it's basically the third of the European Union. It's only overtaken. Uh, significantly by, by London and Paris, we have more than five million inhabitants in the metro area. And uh, of course, it has some uh, records and some strategical assets that are very fundamental, you know, for Italian economy, even, even, even because uh, sometimes the trend that characterize our cities are totally opposite con concerned to the one of the country. For example, let's see, first is economy. Italian economy is not 
doing that good. Uh, Milan is really boosting in the very last years. And I'm here today exactly to you know, demonstrate how the progress in this extended mass transit network had a fundamental imprint in guaranteeing this uh, economical burst of the city in the last years. Also, for example, the dynamic of population has completely changed. You know, Milan is just like many other post-industrial cities, was losing population since the mid of the 70s. But then in 2010, there's been a rebound, and now we're gaining 25,000 inhabitants per any given year more. Metro network. Nowadays, we have four operating lines, M1, 2, 3, and 5. This is not strange, as this morning we've been told a lot about VN. As you know, in VN they have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6 in this case. Uh, so it's, we're, not, we're not the only one. I mean, having, of course, also the 4 is under construction, like, like uh, they'll think about line 5 in VN as well. Uh, it's a massive network. I mean, uh, there are just four lines, but they're kind of long lines. So nowadays we have more than 100 kilometers length extensions for all concerned uh, line lengths. Uh, track length is more than double, uh, 113 stations, and all the metro lines are operating with a headway, which is in between in the peak hours, uh, between 120 and 240 seconds. So uh, that means uh, capacity, which is picking up all close to 40,000 passengers per hour per direction on the main lines. And also the network is basically the quickest and easiest and more comfortable way to move around the city. Uh, we have more than 1.3 pass, uh, million passengers per day and about half a billion per year. This is just, oh, this is not belonging to us, it's belonging to the operator, which is ATM, and it's the scheme, of course, of the network. But this is uh, the scheme more responding to, the, this is a, basically a plan of, of Milan, downtown Milan. You see, we have, in this case, five lines, because line four is under construction. Actually, it's the largest uh, work in progress in Italy so far. Uh, the metros are technically different from each other. Let's see, the starting from M1. M1 has been the first, of course, it's belonging to the 60s. It's belonging to the 60s, and it's a traditionally heavy system with 110 meters standard for platforms, and trains are basically, according to the model, about 105 meters long, using the composition with six coaches. Beginning, there was the scheme uh, uh, locomotive, uh, trail locomotive uh, multiplied by two, and nowadays it's also this scheme has changed, uh, and basically all the trains are composed by six articulated coaches. Uh, with the open space inside. The first line was having, uh, the supply line was uh, by ground, like we were using third and fourth rail, while the new M2 and M3 lines, which were, they were being following, M2 is basically belonging to the 70s, M3 the 80s, the, the dimensional standard is the same, so we're always speaking about 110 meters for platforms and 105 pretty much according to the model for trains. But the supply line is different. They have, you know, the overhead supply line. The big change has been with the new line. You know, they recently opened the M5 line and the under construction M4 line. We totally changed conception, even because, of course, the city is getting crowder and crowder and denser. It's much more complicated to work in cut and cover. So, in recent years, we've been using, uh, we were been focusing a lot on the TBM excavated galleries. That means. The concept was using technology to reduce the impact on surface. So the, ch the choice was using uh, maximize the use of TBM and at the same time reducing the size of uh, handicrafts such as stations. In order to guarantee a similar or at least comparable cap system capacity, we of course turn ourselves to automation. That's why the new lines are all automated and driverless. Thank you this automation. Uh, the standard this time is not anymore 110 meters, it's just 50 meters for trains and platforms, which of course, by the way, of course, uh, nowadays some people are complaining, say, uh, you always say that you try to minimize impact, uh, but we see, we are currently seeing a lot of impacts in the city, how can I say, you should have seen what would have been if we didn't switch to a smaller size, actually, because of course, yeah, yeah, it's funny, it's funny, but it, it's dramatic because unfortunately the sensibility of population is changing. Uh, it, during the 60s, even blocking an entire uh, kilometers long main artery was maybe nothing people were tolerating.
waiting as we were in the, in the heart of the industrial boom. Nowadays, it's enough, one, one, the, the 100th part of this impact and everybody is screaming, so we have to cope with this. Uh, in any case, uh, the new lines have this smaller standard and, uh, and in this case, the supply line is once again on the ground, but it's third rail only and not third and fourth rail like it is in Metro Line 1. And um, another thing, and this is interesting because basically the new systems are more flexible. The traditional heavy lines M1, from 1 to 3, they have a, a minimum radius about one, technically 150 meters, but in reality it's very seldom you go below 200. And uh, uh, a maximum slope of 3.5%. The new lines, they, they are much more flexible in the sense that, for example, they tolerate up to 6% uh, slope and uh, even 50, 60 meters and turning radius. But there's a complication because, of course, if you want to use a TBM, then the TBMs force you not to have smaller than 180 turning uh, radius for curves. Um, <coughs> It's an extending network. Uh, here you see the, the chart is summarizing the progresses, uh, total and cumulative. What does it mean? You see in the first two columns on the left, you see the length line by line plus the interline links. Uh, so you see how we count to 101.3 kilometers and 113 stations. And then you see what we're expecting to have adding to this total the part of the networks which are under construction in this moment an extension of line one and the entire line four which is a new diametrical axis more than 15 kilometers long and the line under planning <coughs> so you see there's an evolution uh, pretty much consistent not all the projects were having the same pace actually for some of them we're somehow uh, they're somehow under evaluation like for example according to the new legal framework uh, for feasibility study in Italy like in many other European uh, countries it's mandatory to have a cost benefit analysis which is supposed to evaluate different model alternatives it's, that's exactly my job in, in, in my company but what I like you to see is the impressive uh, is the impressive increase of the network in the recent year. Basically, uh, the growth of the network was kind of steady in the last decades till the year 2010. But then in 2010, we really had a boost for several reasons. Of course, the first reason was the ex world exposition in, in 2015, which means, of course, financing, funding, and so forth. But also a completely different attitude from the municipality, which was betting a lot of this path to sustainable mobility. Here I have to open a parenthesis. Unfortunately, Italy is kind of in arrear in the concept of sustainable mobility at the urban scale. Car is dominating everywhere in the country, and uh, the model split is really, it's really poor in many big cities. Comparable to compared to European standards, not only like it used to be one time to Middle European, Northern European, or Western yeah. European, but also to other Mediterranean countries like France itself. I mean, it's, it has a very strong culture of public transport, especially from the 80s, and also Spain did really a lot. You know, and they really bet on sustainable mobility for the major cities, and e even a country with several economical problems like Greece. At least they did a great job for Athens in the extension of metro network. In Italy, apart from Milan, it's a completely different story. Milan, it's really a uh, uh, I'm not really, well, actually, I, I was not even born in Milan, so I'm not boasting, but it, 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 it's a remarkable exception. It's a completely, it's just like, and the, in speaking about public transport, sustainable mobility, just like a, a night and day with the rest of the country. Here you see, that, that, that's why, especially from 2010, the administration decided that we have to bet on metros because we want to move like all the developed and, and, and more civilized metro era of Europe are doing. We can't expect, you know, having a future all based in, in cars going everywhere like it's happening in, in some not that much you know uh, developed areas and the results has been that we gain a plus 28 percent network in just five years so basically uh, more than a quarter more than a quarter more of extension in just five years which is a little little, little time comparing the extension of the network in 2015 to 2010 
And uh, we're expecting to have plus 50%, and it will be like this in just 12 years, which is once again not that long time compared to the size of those infrastructures, which are costing from 1 to 1.5 and more than 2 billions per each in terms of line, billion euros. And um, that's what we call it, uh, and brackets, Asian trend in the sense that we are expecting to see this develop in the Asian countries. Like, of course, it's a completely different historical moment, but it's difficult to notice <laughs> such a big increase in a, a consolidated network in, in, a, in a Western country. But that's what, what's happening in Milan and, and is still happening in these years. Uh, especially for concern coverage, here you see uh, the mass transit coverage on Milan downtown, uh, summarizing you know the uh, metro network and the underground rail link, uh, which is basically the central segment of our Schnellbahns, I mean the suburban lines. Uh, we used to have a one third of the urban surveys covered in 2010. In 2015, we got to at least one half. Of course, I'm just speaking about mass transit system, excluding LRTs and buses and all the rest, and we expect to have more than three quarters by 2025. Speaking about comparison, uh, as I told you, I mean, it's a remarkable network because those characteristics, I mean, more than 100 kilometers and 110 stations so far, uh, makes of Milan basically uh, by, by far the first network in Italy with an extension which is comparable to the, 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 the sum of all the other six put together, but also a European scale uh, we are the seventh in European Union for an extension over more than 40 uh, networks and also the continental scale, including you know, the entire European continent, inclu including Russia and Turkey and everything. It, we are in the seventh place once again for what concerns stations number. And we are speaking about the entire planet, we are among the first 30 of uh, more than 200 networks. Uh, but it's not only metro, uh, this is underground railway link. That has been another revolutionary point in the history of development of Milan transport, because uh, what it is, we call it passante, which is in, in Italian means going through or passing by. Basically, it's the same concept of the middle European Schnellbahn, like, like, like in Vienna, like in, uh, in German cities, or like in Zurich. Uh, the idea was to gather together all the suburban commuter lines from one side to the other of the city and gather them together in a tunnel crossing the city northwest to southeast, which is the more used access in order to work as an additional metro uh, downtown. And in terms of you know, civil works, it, it has been the largest metropolitan infrastructures ever built in Italy, and it's uh, completely planned by, by, by MM. It's more than 16.5 kilometers long uh, and more than 10 kilometers of tunnel in itself. And the standard is amazing because in this case, uh, I told you that the heavy system, of, of the, the heavy metros, they having a 110 meter standards for platforms. Here, the, st the, the standard is 250 meters. Uh, if we compare an underground station, you see these small pictures there. I'm sorry, I could have just put a little bit bigger ones, but if you come to Milan, you will see uh, it's actually they're really remarkable stations. The volume of excavation is five times bigger of a heavy metro line. And please notice that the the, level, the, the rail level is much deeper on average than the other metros, and in some cases those stations have been excavated close to skyscrapers. So, I mean, from the civil war point of view, it's been a really hard challenge, especially in a very densely populated city such as Milan. And then, of course, uh, the underground railway link is uh, somehow cooperating with the Beltline and the local railways in order to serve this system which is basically the suburban lines of Milan. Of course, they are operated by the local railways, but as you can see, in the system is really central of this uh, work, which was this underground railway link. This is how it is uh, right now. This is how it will be in 2025, much more lines. And uh, uh, this is a trend. You see, we're gonna have plus 42% lines, and network and station will not be extending a lot because in this case uh, we are more uh, focusing on exploiting more the, infra the infrastructure that we have. Honestly, I I'm glad to be with you now because we have an enemy in this that uh, would be great, you know, that's why I li like to take part in these international heavens because in Italy, unfortunately, we still have some uh, very restrictive rules, rail restrictive rules that are totally unexisting in other European countries. And therefore, they are limiting really the use that we can make of our own infrastructures. Like, for example, 
If I go to, uh, if I use the German Chanel band, if I use the ROR in Paris, or once again the underground link in Zurich or, or the Chanel band in Wien, I see a system which is basically working like a metro system. In uh, our system, in, in from the infrastructural civil work and, and signaling point of view, is absolutely capable of doing the same, but the rules are not permitting it. So if you use Milan Underground Railway links, you will see two conductors per train, then the train is stopping. One is getting off, say, okay, you go. It does like this. I mean, it's, uh, you're not seeing anything like this in the rest of Europe, because of course, uh, of course, there's, uh, you, you use the signal that the, the, the signaling that you can implement, you know. Uh, we are very slow, we, we are kind of quick in planning and in adhering to new technology, but leg legal framework is not so uh, fast. To give you another example, when I was discussing about the metro network, I, I pointed you the difference between the old lines and the new automated driverless lines. Driverless li metro lines are a reality in European continents since the 80s. The first line, I mean, that started in Lille, in France, and then of course in France there was a big uh, burst of the use of these lines and now basically they're, they're going global everywhere in the world. I mean the cities are betting on automation. In Italy the first was built in Turin for the Winter Olympics in 2006. Now hopefully we're gonna have a bis in 2026 with Milan and Cortina. But up to before 2006 it was forbidden to have a public transport network without a driver. So there was a long and complicated pro process of patenting this technology. Even if from the engineering point of view, nothing was missing. Then of course, uh, our network is really working like an interface to the so-called metro system of the country, which is the high speed. In Milan, we have several, Milan is the major now for a high, high speed system in Italy. Uh, we have, uh, wait, wait a second, which is the, uh, I guess it's this, uh, the red dot. Hopefully, yes. Uh, we have Central Railway Station, the main going through station and the gate station, the two existing one uh, under planning. Uh, so several high, high speed train accessibility point and then the metro network and suburban rail network are working like an interface in order to maximize the interaction between these systems and reduce the use of cars downtown and around. Actually, MM also took care of the rail connection to the airport system. Both the two airports of Milan, um, uh, Malpensa Intercontinental Airport, it's uh, linked by a rail uh, branch which has been planned by MM, and uh, under construction Metro Line 4 will connect Linate City Airport. In that case, it's gonna be one of the most accessible city airports in the world because can you imagine, it's just, we're gonna have one train per every 90 seconds at the cost of, uh, okay, it will be now it's one euro and a half, it will be two euros, but in any case, it's nothing, uh, bringing you downtown in less than 10 minutes. So it will be very, very, very convenient. And uh, Milan is living really a, a, a urban and economic, uh, fantastic period, you know, many, many areas have been completely refurbished. The, the skyline of the city has been completely changed. And in all these cases, all the strategical areas, in some cases related to formerly uh, railway used areas or uh, uh, revamping areas of industrial origin, there have been the new center business district and commercial district and sustainable neighborhood of the city. Compared to the speculation okay, the, which characterized the past, in which you know car was the first issue, in this time all these areas have been totally different conceived. The idea was to create carless places, or at least cars are underground, but I mean the, all the spaces are green and pedestrian, and all focused on the main station or accessibility point uh, characterized by interaction of metro and and uh, suburban rails and so forth. So. Uh, a real revolution. The first example, uh, of course, this may be uh, is common to other European reality, but I can guarantee you that in Italy has been a total revolution. Um, Rome, for example, is very far from being like this, uh, uh, absolutely, and, and it's a real pity, of course. That's a uh, World Exposition 2015. It's been really a triumphal success. We have more than 22 million visitors in, the, in, in just six, six months. 
and a spin-off of more than 3 billion euros. And uh, the great success for us has been having basically, let's see, between two-thirds and three-quarters of the visitors coming by public transport, which compared to the country in which the uh, exposition has been set has been an extraordinary success. And then, of course, not only Expo, but also these are some new areas you see. There's this, um, the new central business district, uh, city life district, uh, the future uh, uh, Westfield Center is going to be the largest of Europe. And in all these cases, there's always a major uh, mass transit accessibility, accessibility node underground. Uh, of course, all of these issues and trends are managed by the Sustainable Mobility Plan. Milan has been the first in managing this plan. Uh, they were mandatory by law. They were called, uh, in Italian, just PUM, uh, Urban Mobility Plan. Milan has been the first adding the S for sustainability. It's not just maquillage, but it's been really a radical change into the address of the plan such as this one. Actually, of course, the plan has been set by the municipality, but my company uh, just did consultancy. I, I personally did it, so I, I'm sure of what yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, the main issue was, can, can seems to be easy, but it has been really a Copernican revolution. Italy say, focus of public transport. We, we, we're not only offering an alternative, like sometimes the more, let's see, advanced administration used to think. It, it's really more, let's see, we, want to, we, we also want to diminish the number of people that are using the car at the urban scale. And of course, all the infrastructure that I've been showing you, they were the base for making a, a success of such a politics. Of course, uh, we have a lot of trips in Milan. It, it, it's really the... the <coughs> the first area, not only for size, but also for mobility in the entire country. But the results are speaking very clear clearly. This is what we're really proud about. Uh, this is the model split on Milan downtown in 2013. So I'm not even saying nowadays. I'm, I'm, I'm portraying here 2013 because it's the last complete survey that we had. We're going to have a, a, a new one soon, and then we have some uh, um, more detailed uh, survey, not complete, that are witnessing that this is getting even better, actually. As you can see, the, total, the, the majority, the absolute majority of the trips are made by public transport, 57%. Cars are just 30%. This uh, light blue slice uh, is bicycle, biking. So if you add uh, public transport and bike, you get 63. That basically means that in 2013, almost two-thirds of the trips within the city were basically green. And I'm speaking about 2013. Now, of course, I don't have a total survey, but we have, we have some you know, esteems that I can tell you that this 57 nowadays is close to 60, and this is probably maybe 7. So uh, I, we, we can see that today we, we reached the goal of having uh, two-thirds of the trips of the city um, by green modes. Of course, uh, but this is like this in all the world cities, uh, the story is it's not so positive if you, if you consider the entire metro area where the urban density is much lower and uh, uh, a very expensive infrastructure such as a metro of urban rail, you know, makes it more difficult, you know, to reach in a complete way all the, all, all the areas. But even here we have significant increases because uh, if you see the total, uh, also the total scale, the public transport, even if it doesn't have the total majority, we have a relative majority with 48%, plus the bicycle, we pass 50%, also including the whole metropolitan area, which is more than five, uh, 5 million inhabitants. All of this is based by cost-benefit analysis, mandatory that we, we take care of, of course, nowadays ourselves. And this is just an increase of public transport passengers. You see the big burst for the Expo 2015, but that's one of the last things I want to tell you, because uh, I'm getting long, but uh, that was, of course, expected as it was the year of, two th of the World Exposition. But you see now, in 2017, the trend is, is actually continuing, and it, it's also overtaking the year of Expo. means that we have been successful in changing the habits of commuters and, 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 and city users. Of course, there's some car restrictions that, you know, they've been planned along with the public transport network. And this is 
You know, motorized, oh, oh my God, sorry. Oh. Okay, I, I can tell you actually that was the last one. In any case, just to, just, <laughs> just, just to, just to specify that um, in Italy we have a huge number of cars. We have, uh, we have more than 64 cars per 100 inhabitants, which is basically the most motorized country in Europe and the fourth of the world, even more than Canada, which is of course a completely different, uh, it's a completely different case because it's 30, 33 times larger than Italy. Um, in spite of this, people are really car addicted. Milan is an exception, and we have been able to reduce the 64 per 100 inhabitants to only 50 nowadays. Only 50. And the goal of the administration is to reduce this 50 to 40, which is the average for European large metro areas. We will be successful, we'll think so, because we've been uh, surveying the new patent and, and driving license of, of uh, young people in Milan, 18 to 21, and we have been noticing for the first time a drop of 50%, uh, which is what happened in New York many years ago, and uh, New York Times was stating millennials don't drive, it's happening in Milan, so forth. Let me just uh, conclude with a sentence that I, I'm quoting uh, the former mayor of Bogota, uh, Pedro Gustavo, they used to say, a developed city is not a city in which also poor have cars is a city in which also rich people use public transport. Thank you. Uh -huh.